early 1990s, the focus of United Nations peacemaking and peacekeeping was largely directed towards Africa. In the beginning, these efforts were symbolic of the rest of the world coming to the aid of Africa. And by the turn of the millennium, the continent itself remained peripheral to peace efforts. Fast forward 20 years, and today Africa is the largest regional contributor to global peace operations, with over 90,000 military, police and civilian personnel in service in UN and African Union-led peace operations. And the continent has successfully developed the instruments, expertise and capacity for responding to its own conflicts. This is the story of that remarkable journey and its implications for the future of peace and conflict in Africa. The second half of the 20th century saw many African states free themselves from colonialism. Understandably, there was much sensitivity around national sovereignty. Uh, states uh, started to hold the principle, the doctrine of the non-interference in the internal affairs of member states as sacrosanct. But in April 1994, unprecedented events in Rwanda would inform a profound shift in continental political relations. 800,000 people killed, I think it shocked the world. Uh, and people realized that uh, something had to be done. The horror of the Rwandan experience upended these conventions and provoked a complete review of the continental body. So the paradigm shift from non-interference, which was the Organization for African Unity stance, to non-indifference, which was then the African Union's, was in fact informed by the events in Rwanda, the genocide. Where it is becoming clear that the government is no more acting in accordance with the will of the people and is suppressing the people. The question of sovereignty is not going to be an obstacle anymore, that the AU will intervene. In 2002, the Organization of African Unity was formally reconstituted as the African Union and a new era in African peace operations began. Look, there was a, there was a paradigm shift uh, post-1990, a movement away from interstate conflicts to intrastate conflicts. Uh, together with that came uh, huge atrocities against uh, civilians in a society. In a key move, the AU, with the support of partners, invested in establishing and developing the African Standby Force since 2003. Uh, it has a long historical trajectory, going back to some of the original Pan-Africanist thinkers, such as Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, first president of Ghana, uh, who was a staunch Pan-Africanist who called for an African high command that would have the ability to intervene in crisis situations. This is a standby arrangement where AU member states pledge forces to their regional economic communities or regional mechanisms, who in turn make these forces available to the AU with approximately 25,000 personnel on standby for AU peace support operations. You need to have predictability in that system. That's why then they created the African Standby Force to say, you can't only look for people to deploy at the time the decision is taken to deploy. It takes you another nine months. Now, if it is a genocide, you, by the time you respond, there will be nobody to protect. The ASF project has generated a common African peace support operations doctrine and a host of supporting policies, guidelines and training courses. The overall result is that member states, regional bodies and the African Union Commission have developed a common understanding of what peace support operations mean in the African context. And they have developed the collective capacity to prepare, plan and deploy peace operations. Currently, African countries contribute approximately 50,000 peacekeepers to the UN, which amounts to about half of all UN peacekeepers. And the AU has deployed 12 peace support operations of its own since 2000. But the last 20 years have seen a rapid and dramatic change in the nature of conflicts on the continent. I would say though that's the one big development over the last decade, even in countries like Nigeria, which has the largest economy and one of the largest armies on the continent. You've had, uh, you know, the northwest of Nigeria basically have over 2 million people displaced. Uh, 40,000 people killed by Boko Haram and also by Islamic State for West Africa. So I think 
that is something that needs to worry all of us the seeming ease with which a lot of militant and terrorist groups are able to threaten uh, states the United Nations would be the first to recognize that UN peacekeeping operations are not well suited to undertake peace enforcement or counter-terrorism operations. And so there's this kind of slogan or that have developed um, which says that United Nations operations you know, should not deploy where there's no peace to keep. It changed also then the nature of peacekeeping. So the peace, traditional peacekeeping, which was the interpositioning of peacekeepers between two states that were at war with each other suddenly meant that uh, peacekeepers now had to be deployed within the borders of a country and uh, essentially in most cases interpositioning between civilians and uh, governments within that country. The AU on the other hand does not have the UN's full suite of multi-dimensional capacities nor the UN's assessed contribution funding system to enable it to undertake or sustain peace operations. The assumption of the AU and our policy document, specifically the uh, policy framework on the Africa Standby Force, uh, is based on joint work with the UN, and then that AU will serve as first responder, and then uh, stabilize um, an area or a situation or a country, and then hand over to the UN that has uh, the capacity for longer term um, peace building or post-conflict reconstruction. This is the model that was followed in Darfur, Burundi, Mali and the Central African Republic. And this division of work is likely to continue to be the model of choice for both the AU and the UN for the foreseeable future. Another dimension to this relationship that has emerged is the use of robust African brigades to complement UN peace operations. This adaptation first emerged out of the need to deal with the threat posed by armed groups in the Eastern DRC. But this model has since been used also in the UN mission in South Sudan and in Mali. Fast changing conditions on the continent have meant that this dynamic is far from static and the roles of the two organizations and their relationship remain fluid. The United Nations and the Africa Union both acknowledge that they cannot do all of their work by themselves. But I think there's a much healthier um, relationship between the UN Security Council and the PSC than there was before. And I think it's a relationship that is still developing. We need to get to a point where there is harmonized decision making. Obviously for the Africans, the, the most important would be the, 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 the speed we react to conflicts. If we look at the most recent agreements, for instance, in the last two, three years, uh, related to Sudan, related to the Central African Republic, you can see these are South Sudan, you can see these are African-led processes uh, supported by the United Nations, very close cooperation between the United Nations Security Council and the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. So a much stronger strategic partnership in a sense that have developed between the United Nations and the African Union as a result of this capacity that have been built in Africa over this uh, two decades. In the AU Peace Support Operations Doctrine, there is a strong sense of shared responsibility around a common African identity and purpose. An outbreak of violent conflict in one country impacts on its neighbors and the region. The animating ideology behind uh, the African Union's interventions, for example, is a, is a sense of Pan-African solidarity. The AU now has a full suite of structures and policies to undertake peace missions. Of course, I've talked about the Africa Peace and Security Architecture that gives us this platform as the mechanism that offers the tools at the disposal of the Peace and Security Council to address conflict uh, situations on the continent. Together with other elements of APSA, such as the Continental Early Warning System, the Panel of the Wise and the Peace Fund, and directed by the Peace and Security Council, APSA is responsible for maintaining African peace and security. So all our policies have been uh, developed around these core principles, and of course in coordination with uh, the Rex, who serves as uh, building blocks of the African Union. So the regional economic communities and regional mechanisms are critical in all our work as African Union. 
and uh, I think today what we have in, on the continent is a sophisticated uh, array of mechanisms, not all working completely efficiently, but at least theoretically uh, in terms of policies, in terms of uh, capacity, building, etc. Those mechanisms are there, the skills are there. So over the last 25 years or so, we've built a body of knowledge, experience, uh, that I think over time we are improving. We have developed, we have developed in leaps and bounds. Uh, today we, we can say that the, U, the UN is learning lessons from the work that we, that we do. AUP support operations have a history of coming to the aid of Africans at risk when the UN was not able or willing to deploy UN peacekeepers. African Union peacekeeping or peace support operations uh, have had this uh, willingness uh, to deploy even when uh, conflict is still ongoing to protect civilians or to counter insurgency to help pr protect a government and its people against an insurgency or against international terrorism. The UN deploys in three months. The conflict rages and causes even more havoc during that period. So there is a rapid um, deployment capacity that has been built up on the continent. And this is uniquely African. In Darfur, Burundi, Somalia and the Central African Republic, the AU deployed into situations which the UN deemed not yet fit for UN peacekeeping. Somalia was a completely failed state at the time that the African Union uh, took over. So the fact that the African Union has stayed the course for over 10 years in itself, it's something that is commendable. AU missions, especially in Somalia, CAR and against the LRA, have made use of offensive force where needed. For, for the UN, you will note that um, we talk about consent, impartiality and non-use of force. Now, that will be challenged in uh, Somalia. For the AU, our own core uh, principle or doctrinal basis looks at uh, stabilizing a country and prevent uh, escalation of conflict. So in that regard, we deploy to ensure that stability and to prevent uh, mass atrocities. It was really you know, a very nasty situation in Central Africa, a lot of killings of civilians. Just 50 meters after the headquarters, you got with bridge. So that was the end of, you know, normal life in Bangui. So if you look at Bangui now, and at that time I always used to see maybe around 20 vehicles in Bangui. 20 vehicles, huh? really, to be honest. And if you look at Bangui now, you have, you know, traffic jam all over. You got the impression that you are in a normal city like in all Africa. So that means, uh, you know, we have achieved a lot together. The AU's most recent operation in the Lake Chad Basin exemplifies this approach. So now, for instance, in the instance of uh, the Multinational Joint Task Force against Boko Haram, you will note then that the countries affected have their troops operating in their area, but coordinated by a multinational headquarters and that's why we are trying to make sure that um, all our efforts, comprehensive as they are, incorporates and uh, facilitates joint work between the African Union and those uh, regional economic communities and regional mechanisms. This emerging model of African peace operations has four key stabilization characteristics. They operate in the midst of ongoing conflicts, they contribute to restoring and maintaining stability, they operate in support of and alongside the security forces of the host nation. And finally, they are mandated to use force, including offensively in the face of anticipated attacks against themselves and those they are tasked to protect. Whilst not every operation matches with all of the elements of this model, these are the most dominant and persistent trends in AU peace support operations. The African Union has been able to adapt, to change and develop some of the most interesting types of operations that we've seen on the ground. Whether it's through the development of operations that are related to, to regional coalitions or the engagement with, with their own countries like we've seen, for instance, in the case of Uganda and the fight against the LRA. But also smaller engagements to provide support to development of capacity at the national level, as we see in the Gambia now. It's really 
uh, uh, bringing new initiatives and trying to be at the cutting edge of international responses to conflicts. So yes, we're living at that time when there is a, a new debate coming up to say, how should we make this tool more effective? So I think it's an evolution uh, of, of, of the concept of PSOs. We don't think it's making PSOs irrelevant. We think the form of PSOs that we had post Second World War for 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, is needs to change. The AU's peace support operations should not, however, be misunderstood as an attempt to impose a military solution to conflict. Every report around peace support operations tells you that there can't be military solutions to the kinds of conflicts that we're having. You need more uh, political interventions. The AU has, either as part of its peace support operations or simultaneously, used its special envoys, special political missions and good officers' tools to seek lasting political solutions. So in that sense, we receive far more engagements from the African Union when it comes to mediation, when it comes to peace building or post-conflict reconstruction and development, on conflict prevention at large, on governance issues, on youth, on gender, and the realization that in order to be effective, an organization like the African Union has to be dealing with the wider range of requirements that sustainable peace provides. In Somalia, for instance, where AMISOM is engaged in stabilization, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations, the AU understands that Al-Shabaab can only be defeated in the long term if the government of Somalia can offer better security, governance and socio-economic opportunities than Al-Shabaab can provide. A lot remains to be done and what remains to be done in Somalia is much more political than it is military and I think the African Union is getting there. Uh, the one lesson, in my view, that we are busy learning is fundamentalism, whether it's in Nigeria or in Somalia or in the Sahel spreading south to the northern parts of Mozambique, cannot be dealt with with military force, with drone warfare. The answer is a socio-economic one or even political. The answer is, is to enter into dialogue with those who feel fronted, affected by the political economy of their situation. And until the local governments, national governments of the various countries develop their own capability to deal with the situation. Otherwise, uh, and also work out the issue of dealing with those who are disadvantaged and work out the issues of law and order, work out the issues of unemployment and poverty, and probably that's where the battle can be mostly won. And so I think this again calls for strengthening African capacity to be able to resolve its own conflict. And if we have the capacity to be able to govern ourselves and have strong and capable states, then it's less easy for terrorists, you know, some of them just hundreds of terrorists, to overrun what are very fragile states. African Union peacekeeping has come a long way in just 20 years. Nevertheless, many challenges remain. A key issue is financing. Peace missions are incredibly expensive. Let's take the Congo. You are talking about 1.5, 1.7 billion US dollars a year. And this raises inevitable issues around the control of missions. This has always been a sore point that uh, those who pay want to dictate uh, who should command, how they should command uh, peacekeeping forces. The Peace Fund is one of the five pillars of APSA and was established for Africa to support its own conflict management activities. The important thing was for us to have uh, a mechanism that we can use to build our own funds. The 0.2% levy, which is supposed to be imposed on uh, imports of countries and transferred directly to the African Union to fund peace operations and peace building uh, interventions uh, is, is perhaps one of the most significant decisions that the African Union heads of state have ever made. It's, it's an aspiration and which I think 
every African country is committed to meeting. Institutional capacity and oversight mechanisms have been significantly strengthened and the Peace Fund is set to play an important role in the future. And the African countries, if they're really serious about taking leadership for addressing crises on the continent, they need to put the money where their mouth is and um, actually act to send the resources, the required resources. This is a complex issue and some argue there should be equality in all aspects of peace operations support. We send the troops, not just in Africa, but globally, right? Those who are paying for, for peacekeeping, they are not putting boots on the ground. So we need to balance that out a bit more. So it's not just African bodies that are on the front line here globally. Looking ahead, the looming impact of climate change threatens the stability of the continent and promises to dramatically impact peace operations. We are having challenges of displacement now, not because of uh, wars, as we have seen in the past, but because of drought and because of farming, and that has huge implications. And I think we are seeing now that the link between climate change and security conflict or security-related re conflicts is one that has come to stay. Uh, it's not possible to ignore that. And that means that there must be further and stronger focus on mitigation and, and other efforts uh, to reduce the impact of, of, uh, of global warming. Gender mainstreaming and enhancing the role of women in peace operations has been one of the highest priority issues for the African Union and for civil society organizations supporting peace processes like Accord and TFP. You know, Women, Peace and Security is based on Resolution 1325. And so what, we, what, what it recognizes is that we need more women to be involved in peace, op in peace processes. Uh, we've done well in terms of uh, the African Union having a special envoy uh, for Women, Peace and Security. And she's really put things on uh, into perspective for us and brought it onto the agenda of very many African countries. I don't, I don't think we would have been this far in Africa had we not had that particular office. And we also have the uh, uh, mechanism referred to as FEMWISE, wherein uh, FEMWISE um, gives the platform for women to be able to contribute to these processes. However, there remains much to be done. A much larger role for women basically across the board with regard to development and peace and security is essential for bringing the continent forward. What we need to do is to make sure that we highlight that role that uh, women have played traditionally and make sure that we more formalize it into what becomes the structural uh, relationship in uh, peace building. Any peace agreement that doesn't include the voice of the women will fail in the 10 years to come. That's the reality because it is based on power sharing rather than on responsibility sharing. It's not just participation in the military, but participation in the justice system, participation in uh, government and participation in... So all governance mechanisms should see uh, women voices and faces. What we need to do is to make the conversation more African-centered, you know. So yes, 1325 is an African-centered resolution, but how do we get African women voices to be more part of the global discussion and informing things that are happening within um, Africa? In 1995, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, together with NUPI, Accord and ISS, established the Training for Peace program. To date, Norway has invested over $50 million in helping to build African capacities for peace and security. 25 years is, is quite some time. I think it's fair to say that Training for Peace is uh, a bit of a flagship project for us, uh, both in the development sense and also in the security sense and the link between these two. The focus of Training for Peace was very much on the civilian and police dimensions because there were a number of other major players like the US, the UK, France, which was very much focusing on the military dimension of peacekeeping operation and on, on capacity building uh, and investment in those areas. After the launch of the African Union in 2002, focus shifted to building capacity at the continental body. 
But then we started off from the African Union essentially not having any policies at all to guide its, you know, development of its civilian and police component. Accord's role in all of this, uh, complementing the African Union's capacity, has been to develop the civilian dimensions of peacekeeping, to build from scratch uh, the doctrine, the policies that go with that, the entire package of what needed to be developed in terms of the civilian dimensions of peacekeeping was done by Accord through the TFP program that was funded by the Norwegian government. At the same time, the focus of ISS was on helping develop the police capacities of the African standby force. But from the ISS side, we felt that was particularly important of working with the police components. Police components correspond to quite a considerable percentage of the number of peacekeepers. But for many years, there was a lack of understanding of how can we improve the role of this core function. And NUPI supported the AU at a policy and doctrine level, especially in women, peace and security and the protection of civilians. Accord also assisted missions like Amazon to train their civilian staff. TFP then helped to develop a mechanism for the African Standby Force to ensure civilian and police experts are pre-trained and ready to deploy rapidly when needed in African peace operations. So it became important to create a mechanism from which you could um, readily recruit civilians for substantive positions in peace support operations and that is where the concept of the African standby capacity comes from. By this time, TFP's role had expanded rapidly beyond its original training mandate. But the work that we do right now is much broader than the initial training program to peacekeepers that were about to be deployed for the first time to become a far more complex program that is interested in the results of making sure that the African Union is more effective, whether it's through research, capacity building, policy development. If we look at where the African Union itself was and where it is now, I think, in terms of the development of its civilian and police components, I think that we can share in that success. It has also has the particularity, uh, if you like, of, of being uh, a continuous north-south uh, cooperation where you have gotten these uh, perspectives uh, for both from, from outside of Africa and, and within Africa. Looking at what is the new, the new trend in peacekeeping, what kind of knowledge, what kind of capacities is going to be needed uh, for the next four or five or even ten years. There has been strong recognition from the AU of the value of this contribution. Training for peace, the Accords of this world have contributed immensely uh, to this. Today we, we do take for granted some of the tools we're using today in peace support operations. So they don't sit out there and criticize us and say, well, the, the rules of, the engage, of engagement of the AU are rotten. They don't want to take responsibility. They go around killing women. They actually come here and say, your rules of engagement are no longer meeting the requirements or the standards of international humanitarian law. But we can assist. TFP is understanding that responding to conflicts in the future will take the form of a myriad of actors. And it is not just simply enough to talk about it or for that matter, just build the capacity of those non-traditional, non-mainstream respondents. But it is about ensuring that the institutions of the African Union, the RECs, develop this capacity, rosters this capacity, and deploys this capacity. And I think that it's going to be one of the longer-lasting impacts of this particular project. Looking forward, we can reflect on tremendous positive accomplishments in a very short time period on the continent. So over the last 25 years or so, we've built a body of knowledge, experience, uh, that I think over time we are improving uh, in how we uh, respond to uh, internal conflicts uh, through peacekeeping. Without question, we will need to continue to innovate and improve. I am optimistic, yes, um, because we have some good stories. I am concerned, yes, because um, it seems that even as we make progress in some areas, we get confronted with challenges in other areas. Is the original intention or the original intent or the original architecture, if I might use that word, of peace support operation, is it still relevant as a response tool 
in today's conflicts. The types of operations that will be deployed in, in, in the upcoming years will have to be different. They have to be more nimble, they will have to be more transnational, they will have to be able to identify how to deal with a complexity of situations where originally the organization wasn't designed to do. So I'm saying that it's about time that Africans must deal with the problems that you also contribute in our creation through pet governance and begin to be serious about the management of our own affairs. But overall, the picture should be one of optimism and pride. And nobody can put the genie uh, of globalization back into the bottle. Um, nobody can put the genie of regional integration back into the bottle. There is a statement of Pan-Africanism when you send your own citizens to another country to try to assist it in addressing its crises. I think the, the overall picture of Africa today is, is not you know, the Africa of famine, the African of disaster, the Africa of conflict. Uh, by far the majority of African countries have shown tr enormous uh, economic growth, have shown democratization. So I think the, the, the bigger picture in Africa is, is significantly different than it was in 2000. And although we still have these uh, pockets of, of conflict, which are important and which we are still responding to and have to deal with, um, that for me today is no longer the, the primary identity of Africa. But if we mobilize our resources together and we work together in harmony and we silence the gun, Africa will rise and the people of Africa will rise.